which is a book I edited with six other fantastic editors, some of which are in the room today. Um, and it's one of many events which will be coming through the course of this year, which will be then um, going on to um, the Placemaking Handbook YouTube channel. And I'll post a link to that in the chat um, in a little while. Um, we are recording this uh, session and it will go on to that YouTube channel. So just to make you aware of that. And you've all been really good at doing this already, but thank you for having your mics off. Brilliant. Um, questions, you can pop those into the chat. And also because there's so many of us in the space, if you could actually use the Zoom function to raise your hand. Myself and Lisa Jones will be adminning the session, so that will help you bring your face to our attention so you can ask that question there. The chapter which um, Rosanna and Marcus um, wrote and brilliantly wrote is the conclusion to the handbook. And the handbook takes you through lots of practice and theory and research and the artist voice, the community voice. And what this chapter so brilliantly, so deftly did was bring all of that together in a really engaging conversation, the subject of which is, is what brings us here today. And then really help or take the reader back into their own practice. So how can we, how can the reader apply what they've learned back into what they've, they're doing? It is a fantastic chapter and those that are speaking here today are the voices in that chapter too. That's all that I'm going to say because we need to get on to the really interesting stuff here. So Rosanna and Marcus, if I can hand over to you. Thanks so much, Cara. Um, I'm going to share my screen, which hopefully will work. Uh, while I'm getting that up, I'd just like to reiterate Rosanna and my thanks to Cara and team for their support in, in getting the chapter into the book and also in making today happen. Uh, it's a real privilege to be with you all. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll get some really interesting conversations. Can I just get somebody's confirmation that you can see the shared screen? OK, yeah, yeah thumbs up. That's brilliant. So rewriting our relationships with place or hearing from places and speaking back to places. Let's go on a walk, but by the power of lockdown, let's go out onto the street together. The moment we step out of the door and onto the street, we're embraced by a place doesn't matter where we are, but let's go on to this market street. We're embraced by everything that's around us. And from here, our, our relationship with our environment starts to build. As we continue to stroll, what signs or signals do we pick up on first about the street that we're on? What prompts us to stop or look again or acknowledge people or particular characteristics that we might not have recognized before? And over time, how might our responses affect other people's connections with the street or with that, that place too. Roland Barthes tells us, or he told us in, in the 80s, the city speaks to us and its inhabitants, to its inhabitants and we speak our city simply by living in it, by wandering through it, by looking at it. But this second part of his, this quote on the screen is really important. The problem is to bring an expression like the language of the city out of the purely metaphorical stage. At this time, when so many things are changing around us and placemaking is changing, city making is changing, everyday life is changing, Rosanna and I feel that this kind of finding a way to bring the expression of a city out, out of the metaphorical is something that urgently needs to be revisited. Over the last year, so many things have changed. Our relationships with other people have changed. Our connections to, to so many things we, we're used to has changed. And now, you know, our relationships with streets and neighbourhoods has, has changed dramatically. We've been compelled to stay home more because of multiple lockdowns through the pandemic. Rosanna and I describe um, being able to speak back to our, to to places or with places as, as having active voices in, in a street or a neighbourhood. On the one hand, through this last year, we've seen some amazing examples of neighbours talking and taking, active, taking and activating their own streets. Kids have been choosing to 
draw on the pavement or to use a, use a street in a way that hasn't been seen for years. People have been, at the first pandemic in particular, people were using their doorsteps to connect together. There was clapping. People have been planting or making artwork in their own environments. On the other hand, places have been changed through changes to infrastructure and the ways we can move about. But through all this, we ask whose voices have we masked or muffled in, in through this process and perhaps it's a it's a useful reminder this past year to to ask who whose voices have we masked or muffled for way too long not just in the past year but through through the way we've been making cities or places over recent decades are that how could we unpack or give way to a wider wider sets of voices can we use this time now to start to rebalance those voices and rewrite our relationships with places? We think there's a great chance. I think, excuse me. To give a bit of context, uh, Rosanna and I have been working on a series of projects and engaged activities over the last decade or so, um, asking questions, developing tools, and reflecting on learning, which fit together under the umbrella that we call urban lexicons. This has involved close working with community men members, with placemakers, with place managers, between the UK and Europe and the USA and Australia. And we've been learning about what helps establish meaning or reflect different uh, definitions for people and what frames the character of a particular place what's important for people to feel connected to places. And this builds on work that we've been respectively undertaking, including on identities with community, on social safer places, on inclusive agency, and on community street design with different groups and organizations. We started asking questions about what makes us fall in love or out of love with different places. Why can we instantly fall head over heels for one place and yet feel utterly repelled or excluded by another place? We found that these topics deep, are deeply affected by this notion of an urban lexicon as a vocabulary of meanings and signs and symbols or sensations through which we each connect differently to cities and streets and the people in them. So today we'd urge everyone to think about how we can hear from and make space for hearing from as well as space for speaking back through the cities and places that we're involved in as we change and as, as the way we relate to places change, changes around us. Colin Illard, some time ago, um, put to, uh, five, six years ago, put together a book called Places of the Heart, which some of you might know, and, and he says that we build onto the landscape specifically to change perceptions in order to influence thoughts and feelings. And by these by these means, we attempt to organize human activity. He says by these means, we can grow to love a place in much the same way as we love a person. So if we can develop this level of emotional connection for a place, surely that's evidence of or a, a useful reminder of the fact that throughout time we've had this innate connection to land and to the environments around us and, and how they enable us to connect with others. It's an ancient trait, perhaps epitomized by Aboriginal songlines, but as the role of shaping a place has been drawn away from the communities that occupy it, perhaps the sense of identity has also been slipping away from them or hasn't been expressed in neighborhoods at least. So what are the next triggers for people to be able to build together again or to be to feel reflected where they live and where they are in day to day places? I'm going to hand over now to Rosanna to pick up from an example from Ridley Road. Sure. Well, you know, to Marcus's question, where are the triggers? You just need to take to the streets to, to, to learn. There's so much to learn. So take a snapshot of a street like Ridley Road Market in Hackney in London. Um, now, does this scene present you as full of life and inviting or kind of chaotic or edgy or maybe all of these things? And actually, that's that's the point. Um, the next slide is we argue that it's the responsibility of anyone who considers themselves a placemaker who help draw out character and kind of make meaning 
more accessible and more negotiable for everybody. Um, in this context, every you know, pool holder, Pete with his fresh fruit and veg, is a placemaker. The shopper parking the shopping trolley in the street is a placemaker. You know, Lydia, the shop owner who's brought her, her uh, seat out for her kids onto the street is a placemaker. This is less about material design. It's really about allowing characters and characteristics to float to the top. And we've seen that a hell of a lot um, during the pandemic, which has brought a whole host of placemakers out of the woodwork from government initiatives on the one hand to neighbors getting together in more impromptu ways. Public space is now the new social space and actions, uh, people's actions speak louder than words. So we've seen people adding, enriching, editing, adding literally signs of love to the NHS here in the UK and others, your self-expression uh, or welcome, but also um, new places, new spaces for more voices people have been taking away. There have been signs of triumph. You know, the first actions, as we said, of agency, people taking over the street, have opened up opportunities for others to have a conversation about what's appropriate or not in their streets, what the narrative and story is uh, in those streets. So follow, in, in London, the, the mayor's office created uh, the Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm just a few days after the toppling of the Costume Statue in Bristol. And even if laws have now come in to stop the defacing of monuments, what we're seeing is moments marked that show that different cultures can be reflected and celebrated, and that what we put in our public spaces matters in terms of defining our collective identity. And I think this is another question. If a five-year-old kid is a placemaker, or a protester is a placemaker, what can we all learn from that, especially those who consider ourselves to be professionals in that field? Well, we think that you should sweat the small stuff. You know, we need to shift the lens from master to micro to make space for individual characters and expressions to come through. And there's good thinking out there already, um, the, like the work of the charity Common Ground, um, and we love this quote by uh, by the mayor: "Little things and clues to previous lives and landscapes may be the very things that breathe significance into the street." I think this idea of significance is key because for us, placemaking is really meaningful. And when we wrote this chapter, we knew that we wanted to bring in a whole different set of perspectives, which is why we've got a series of panelists and you also here today. And so we asked people uh, around the table, you know, their thoughts on hearing from the city and speaking back and thinking about the aspects of what a place means to us. Um, and we had six important themes. So the first was uh, around trust, agency, reciprocity. If you go back to the relationship with the city, it's like any relationship, right? It works both ways. We need to have our voice heard. To build, we need to trust the place it needs to trust us. They both play their part um, in giving us an active role. And also once you have that in place, uh, collective confidence shows up, right? And that can build change among the community. Once we have that confidence to express ourselves in a place, that's when soul becomes evident. Expressions of individual characters, whether a name above a shop sign or a layering of personalities. And finally, love and a little bit of magic, which is something you can't plan for uh, to the planners, but we can leave space for people to show it. They are tenets of any good relationship in general. And so the same applies to good relationship with place. So, you know, this work, as we said, draws on lots of different perspectives. It's a call and response. And we ask a series of questions. We want to explore opportunities for rewriting this relationship, but also making it real. And we're delighted to have AJ Hastrick from Participatory City here today to kick the conversation off with our panelists in just a minute. But just before we do, I also want to say that your voices are also important. And, uh, you know, please add comments and questions into the chat. We want to uh, save some time at the end for that. And do continue to stay, uh, to, to send us any ideas or opportunities or conversation uh, here, which we'll show this right at the end. But I'm going to hand over to AJ uh, right now uh, to kick off the conversation. Thanks, AJ. Great to have you. Absolutely, no worries. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for that beautiful, beautiful presentation. As was Anna said, my name is AJ Astrup, and I am part of I'm a project designer there as part of the Everyone Every Day project. And like like the presentation said, I'm, my role has been very much embedded in this and I've seen this come to life. When you give space to individuals, what do they come up with and what is left in the latent assets and capabilities? People also always have big, big dreams and ambitions. And once you get, give space to that, there's so much beauty that can come to a space and change the narrative of the area. So I am also joined by three amazing panelists. 
um, that have contributed to the chapter to answer these questions as well. So I'm going to introduce just a rough introduction. All their further details are on the website at Urban Lexicon. So if you want to find out more details about who they are and what else they've said, please go to the site. So we've got Jessica Riley, um, who is a human-centered designer um, and has a focus in surface and print design. We've got Duncan, architect, placemaker, and urban designer. Hey, hey, hey. And we've got Canon, who is also uh, an architect. Oh, have I got it wrong? <laughs> architect, placemaker, and urban designer. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go to the first question. And we're going to kick off with Canon, who can do a little bit of a better introduction to himself than I just did. Um, so yes, please, Canon please kick it off with the first question. So what are the ways we understand a city um, and how can it speak to fruits people, fruits uh, spaces and public spaces? It's kind of there. Hi there, I wasn't able to unmute. Thank you, AJ. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, very good, thank you. So just to clarify, I'm actually a landscape architect. Uh, I'm an educator at the Bartlett and I'm an author of a book called Staging Urban Landscapes. So first off, just to say thank you so much for this invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this impressive and I would say expansive project. Uh, the first thing I'd just say is I'd like to recall a quote that I heard Rab Bennett say, which he said, the confidence of a city is in its public realm. And so to explore that first question of how, how a city speaks to us and how we can effectively speak back, I'd like to explore this answer through uh, the ideas of Guy Debord and the Situationist and the landscape architect Christophe Giraud. So the situation, a central idea was that mainstream media and advertising creates a sort of artificial reality that conceals the authentic everyday existence of urban life. And they called this artificial reality the spectacle. And as a response to this, the situationists developed methods for everyday experimentation, which they called psychogeography. And this was simply an alternative method for exploring the city that encouraged pedestrians people like you and me to stray from our typical patterns of movement. And the ultimate desired response was that we would become more aware of our overlooked surroundings and begin to see new possibilities for experiencing the everyday, uh, the life of the city, how things unfold uh, each and every day. And arguably the most relevant idea from psychogeography was that the notion of drift. And I love this idea that you just simply by coming off of your daily routine, uh, you're, that there's an unplanned walk through the urban landscape. And this was really determined by the person's emotional response to the surrounding cityscape. So it's something that you're feeling, something that's visceral. It's not so much that you're being directed by wayfinding. There's something uh, innate and, and built into our, our systems to really understand our surroundings. So it was basically a method of walking in which our movement is determined by the city. So if there's anything that really speaks to this, this question about seeing the city and listening to the city, I think it's uh, De Borg and the Situationist approach to how they walk through a place. And then the other important thing that I find really fascinating, and, and I always revisit this, this essay by Christophe Giraud, who's a landscape architect, and he wrote this essay called Four Trace Concepts. And he unpacks four key themes, landing, grounding, finding, and founding. And he opens this essay through the French term of landscape called paysage, which means land or countryside, but it also conveys the qualities that are both visible and invisible, the environmental and the cultural landscape project that operate simultaneously. And he's very careful to make the point that the important things to focus on are those that already exist and to see and to listen deeply into those landscapes, those public spaces, those urban uh, landscapes that we'll walk through. So just a couple brief introductions to these four topics. Landing is described as that moment when we as designers or we as observers and visitors to a city still don't know anything about a place. And we're, we're preparing ourselves to embark on what he calls a lengthy process of discovery. Uh, so it requires a state of mind where we're feeling. It's about feeling rather than thinking. <clears throat> Nothing is allowed to remain obvious or neutral. Instead, everything is apprehended with wonderment curiosity, and subjective and interpretive eyes. And he makes this analogy that this compares to say the first encounter you have with another person, that it's more meaningful to engage directly with that person through conversation and eye contact than to spy on him or her from afar and simply gather information from other 
sources. It then goes on to talk about grounding and grounding really is this idea around orientation and rootedness. And that there's a difference between landing and grounding is essentially linked to time. So landing is that one first approach to a site, you're learning about a new place, it's immediate and it's distinct. Whereas grounding is something that occurs indefinitely. It's about repeat visits uh, and continually reading and understanding a place as you visit it multiple times. He then goes on to talk about finding, which is this act and process of searching, as well as the actual outcome of discovery, as is what is it you, you discover and what is it you find. And what, what is found oftentimes for all of us when we're working and walking uh, through urban contexts is this becomes the je ne sais quoi ingredient, that the secret sauce, as it were, uh, that conveys a distinct quality of a place. And we always talk about the sense of place, the genus loci, what gives it that, that real richness. And really, this is what we're after. It's trying to uncover what makes a place distinct. And he says this sort of escapes design invention and import. It's about something unique that's often hidden, that definitely belongs to a place and contributes durably to its identity. And finally, to close off and then pass on to everyone else is the idea of founding. And founding is always a reaction to something that was always, that's already there. So we've gone through the process of discovering and then finding it and then applying what we've learned and that knowledge. The solution can be as ephemeral as a stage set or it can take place gradually over an extended period of time. Founding can also be understood as bringing something new to a place, which I think many of us are interested in doing. Um, something that may change and redirect a particular site, such as the placement of a new object, the framing of a new point of view, or simply changing the use of a particular place. And just in closing, I think there's also something incredibly important about the notions of the city as a palimpsest. This idea that there's layers upon layers of history, overlapping materials that speak to the function of a particular place. And it's really down to us to how we interpret those things, how we elaborate them, and how we expand our own narrative as we move through the urban context. AJ, back to you. Thank you so, so very much for that, um, Canon. I love the human, when we're talking about the grounding elements um, and how the human elements speak to us and like understanding the city through those emotive terms is essential to actually bring, allow us humans to understand it better as well. So like the narratives that we can weave through that. Um, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel as well, in case you have any anything sparked you as well. So this is a normal conversation. So if anything gets you going, anything sparks you, please, please say your little piece. Hi, AJ, can I jump yeah, in? Jessica, yes. Oh, yeah. um, so hi everyone, again, thank you for the invitation. I'm really, really, um, really great to be here with you all. Um, so obviously, um, as AJ mentioned, my background is actually in surface and print design. So this is the sort of the context I'm coming from um, to this kind of question, I suppose. Um, and for me, something that's really, um, really important when we're thinking about how a place speaks to us is actually looking at the sort of the colors, the materials that we're seeing there. Um, the, the objects that we find, those things all tell us about, you know, the values, the aspirations, the experiences of the people that live there um, and the decisions that have been made, yes, to put them in, but also how we then respond to those things. Um, and so for me, it's really that sort of material reflection of the society is what we find in our sort of shared spaces um, and our streets and cities. Um, and it's something I think is this, what I find interesting about it is that it's something that we all participate in, whether we're aware of it or not. You know, it's something that we all experience um, and we all shape whether we mean to or not. And so I just think it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, that sort of Im embedded materiality of place um, is definitely something for me that feels that that's how we, we can kind of communicate with it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I like what you talked about response and this is an ongoing conversation. So everything we respond to is then an, a call to then interact, to then do something more. So what does this mean going forward? So this is really, really perfect. Um, and Duncan, anything anything from you, sir? Uh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm unmuted. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah. Um, um, myself and my colleague Ivana uh, contributed to the uh, the chapter in, in the book um, that Rosanna and um, Marcus uh, wrote, and uh, both of us felt that the the city speaks to to people um, best when it conveys a sense of freedom 
and when people feel free to to do what they want to do and and relax and and participate in in that place um and the sort of one of the the best examples is um south bank in london of course and where there's so much going on there and people feel free to, to yeah to to uh to take part in the city uh, however they want to whether it's sort of buskers playing or uh, skateboarders down there or, or whatever or the, or the events that's going on at the the national theater or queen elizabeth hall or something like that and um yeah it's uh it's it's about allowing people to, how how people <clears throat> receive that permission as a, as a place that they feel that they can uh, they can participate in that way. Really, really strong. Again, I think it speaks to that sense of wonder that um, Ken was speaking back in, in his introduction as well to allow wonder and freedom to navigate. And then this word agency as well. So what are the parts that make people feel like they have agency? And I guess this again goes to the conversation that um, what Jessica talks about is the response and how we then can use those materials and things to then start building those things. Really, really, really strong, beautiful. Um, we can move on to the second question now. Um, and it'll be over to you, Duncan. So how can individuals and communities best speak to take active role in the in the oh, in how they relate to their local environments at the neighborhood or neighborhood or city level? Um, well, something that we've been trying to encourage in our uh, work as designers is something, uh, an open-endedness to the design of places and, and spaces that, um, that within, that the, the, the design isn't finished with the, the sort of the planning application and, and, and once it's, it's executed on, on the site, it's, it's not finished. And what we're trying to right. incorporate is um, is an idea of, of stewardship of the landscape from local community groups that might take ownership. And the other thing that's really great about this is that there is an incentive of developers to uh, to do this because it then takes some of the management uh, of the the landscape spaces away from uh, the, the the developers of of the the site uh, that it can be owned and, and maintained by people in the community and the the hope is is that these spaces can then adapt and change over time and community gardens might be incorporated through one period of time or where that changes places where different groups can gather and and meet and um and it seems, seems something that seems even more relevant now sort of post covid that people are looking for these doorstep um spaces for impromptu um events and and meetings um uh, so yes yeah, it's, it's 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 one of the good things to come out of covid hopefully that that there is a, a desire for people to shape their local environments really 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 good points as well i guess i think we we talk about the ground being soft or like the, the fertile ground now to build upon and to speak back to people so like Again, like the, the timing and the urgency right now, so it's a really good moment in time to think about these things. I think Cannon just unmuted himself because I think something sparked his attention. Yes. I think just to build on what Duncan's talking about, I think it's, it's having a stance and uh, knowing what you want to get involved in as a member of the public. You know, we all benefit from cities that are well-designed for the human experience where We've taken cars away to create the atmosphere for us to be able to really understand the city and find those those finer qualities that uh, you need time to to time in the environment really to appreciate those. Um, and really, I suppose just to find the ways that you can get involved. I love the quote from Jane Jacobs, the mighty Jane Jacobs, as we all know, that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody, only because and only when they are created by everybody. I mean, it's. That's the most uh, encapsulating statement I think about this is that we all need to be involved in the big ways and the small ways to really make these the, the cities that we live in and the spaces that we occupy as good as they can be. Um, really, really, really good points again. Yeah, everyone, everyone, this is a collective effort. I guess this this multi multiplicity of people and language and understandings of what these what this starts could look like at different points. I think it's something that I find super interesting. Like this this starts is something that's ebbing and flowing with the times as well. So 
I think Jessica potentially, have you got any points to this as well? <laughs> You're mute? No? You're all good? I think. Sorry. <laughs> Classic. It wasn't letting me unmute then, sorry. Um, yeah, I think, I think just picking up sort of something we were mentioning earlier as well in answer to this question is the idea of agency. Um, because I think something, so as, as I mentioned, I think that the materials and the places we live in, they, they are affecting us whether we know it or not. And so I think actually just the first step is always realising that actually the places we live in are affecting us and we can affect them. And just knowing that that is sort of, um, I suppose, within our reach, I think is actually quite an important sort of first step almost. Um, and I think, you know, just even sort of think, so a project I was working on was called Aesthetics of Place, and that was actually just trying to encourage people to think about the materials, the colours, the things that they're seeing, actually thinking about how they make them feel, you know, what is it about, like, what's it doing to you, what does it make you think, do, feel, um, and sort of understanding what it makes someone else think, do, and feel, and actually um, sort of almost creating this language, or trying to decode this language um, around our places, I think. Um, it's not the answer, but I think it's a kind of first step. Mm, 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 mm. Really, really well said. Really, really well said. Um, maybe, maybe in a, when we, if we have time at the at the end, we can talk about maybe some of the things we know is about the types of materials and um, what different materials do and have affected in different spaces and the reactions. Um, I guess sometimes we speak about places being welcoming. Like, what about a space speaks to you that welcomes you? And uh, again, what um, Don was talking about freedom again. So that might be really, really well said. Um, Rosanna, Rosanna has raised their hand. Yes, please join the conversation. <laughs> I think uh, Lisa needs to unmute uh, <laughs> Rosanna. <laughs> okay, just off. Okay, thanks. Talking of many voices and <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> ironic, but that's fine. I think, you know, one, one thing that Marcus and I have spoken um, quite a bit about and we, we bring into the chats also is, is when you do get all these voices in the play, there is an innate messiness. You've got to allow for a bit of cacophony. And I think it's something that's quite interesting because it, like literally the term planning, <laughs> planning is about like, like marking everything out. We know what's going to happen. And cacophony and spontaneity to some of Canon's earlier points, you know, are, are, are not. So um, the, it, like, how do we, how, how do we get the, the world of planning to allow for this, for this messiness? You know, we, we talked about, um, I think Richard, it was Richard Senate who's starting to bring this up again. And some cities, I think actually in some places just do it much better than others, you know? Um, they feel perhaps a little bit less repressed. You see a lot more street life because they kind of allow for that messiness and, you know, see, see what happens. So I think this will be an interesting thing to, to, to understand like where are we uh, where are we able to experiment actually the work that you're doing at participatory city is a good example i'm not saying it's messy it's not at all but it <laughs> is it is a and it is an experiment you know uh, and and one that a lot of people are benefiting from um so yeah be get getting okay with a bit of a bit of mess is an important factor i think i think maybe to speak on the idea of experiment i think when we're designing projects i think that's the language that we try to help um, residents and people of the places use mm -hmm. That this isn't a fixed thing and if it goes wrong it's fine and it's okay it's okay and we're going to try again and the idea of experimenting with life i think it's an attitude and a flexibility that could be part of everyday life that, and once adopted allows for a lot more polarity in what we see and what we um try to do so 100 100 agree with you rosanna yeah that's it mm, okay we're AJ, if I could just make one more point, I, I think if Dinah Bornatz or Tim Gill were here, he would say to always also engage with the children and the mm -hmm. younger generations and the older generations as well to make sure that there's a good cross section of the different demographics that use cities in different ways. And mm -hmm. there, I, I'm not sure if it's a quote, but you know, this idea that if public spaces can be used and are comfortable by children, they'll work for everyone else. I'm sure that's someone's quote. So apologies for not being able to cite you, but it's it's such a great morsel of truth isn't it to say you know if you can get children comfortable in space the rest of us can fall in line very very true i think that became one of our design principles that families and children are welcome at every project that we try to do and right. it, it changed the landscape of what what was that possible so on top to that um okay we're racing through this as well quite quickly um i'm going to go to the last question now and that will be for jessica so if you could do one thing to support better dialogue in, in the relations between people and the cities in the future, what would you do? 
mean, it's not a small question. To <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, so for me, I think, as I've sort of already mentioned it, but I think this idea of building a common language is really important. I think making it possible for everybody, when I say everybody, I mean in a community, to be able to be part of the conversation. So that might be making sure the language we use isn't specialist, you know, that everyone can understand it. It might mean communicating through things other than language, potentially, so that we're not being limited by um, sort of um, literacy limitations, for example. Um, and I think, so, so, so by sort of first evening out at that field is really important. And then I think particularly um, important is to bring it to the place. So I think, um, you know, being embedded in a place, we've also talked about it already, but being embedded in a place, bringing it to the people of that place, I think is, is absolutely crucial. Um, and also I think, so it, it, I think it's also important to have people from other areas as well coming in. So fresh perspectives, looking at the same problem, different, um, different kind of backgrounds, understandings, experiences is really important to get that kind of variety and diversity as well. Um, and I think by sort of doing all these things, we can sort of encourage this creative agency that I think is really empowering. Um, and I think that sort of our role, or I would see sort of my role would be to sort of facilitate that really, rather than design it. So it, you know, I'm not there to sort of impose or decide or design. It's more that you're there to facilitate and kind of um, implement um, with the sort of community and, and the people that have sort of come up with um, their sort of their place language, for example. Um, something that I, I did see that I thought was quite interesting was um, Franklin Till and um, Agents of Change did a piece of work with children um, looking at designing the um, v &A Museum of Childhood. Um, and they asked these children to kind of respond to these keywords um, through sort of color and objects. And they made these the most amazing, beautiful creations, these children. And then that was then translated into a kind of um, strategy for the design of the museum. And, and I just thought that was a really, so, so bringing that agency to those children was, a, was, was creative empowerment really. And I think that, that for me would be, yeah, the, the first thing I would want to do. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so much, so much. <laughs> But no, amazing, amazing, and their like the, the idea of common language. I think one of the things that you notice across cultures is that there is a common in, like intuition and something that we all understand within the things that, and then allowing these tools of language, wh whatever they may be, um, to allow these intuitions to come alive. Like a place where I can see my neighbors, a place where everyone can play out, a place where I can affect the space as well. So I feel like, yeah, I think that the idea of common languages maybe as well, or like a space for that to be a case would be really, really beautiful. Um, I'm gonna, I think Canon, yeah, Canon's ready. Canon's always ready, go for it. So. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. Uh, I would say increasingly for me, it's about trying to master the art of scale. Mm. I think it's one of the most overlooked aspects of what we do as designers is really understanding how big a space is, what does it do? How does it operate? How do people feel in that space that we're creating? And it's not just down to the architect, it's not down to the urban designer, it's not down just to the landscape architect. We all have a part to play in saying, what is this place meant to be? What is it that's, that is uh, underpinning this space that could help us to decide how big it should be? You know, we're now 20 years in, about two decades into this idea of the programmable activated space, the notion that Landscape isn't it about isn't about scene anymore, as in the, the sublime or the um, the picturesque. It's about landscape as verb, the notion that it's doing something, that it's performing, that it has that agency. So you know, in two decades, we've done a huge amount as far as how we activate those spaces. We're now at a critical point, I think, where we need to really one diversify the amount of activation, so it's not this ubiquitous scattering of food trucks and table tennis tables and the typical activators that we see spread across the globe. But also, again, to quote Anita Berzdetia, she writes in, um, in almost 20 years ago, she wrote this, but she talks about creating uh, the, the precisely open rather than the loosely vague. That is this idea that we're creating open spaces that are flexible, but they've been left open with real precision because we know what we want to go in there. So it's gonna feel comfortable on the everyday. People can sit in that space and not feel overwhelmed that it's this 
this empty space, but it can still swell and expand when you need people to come together. Love that they are intentionally precise, open. Uh, sometimes it feels like a it feels like a contradiction or oxymoron when you put these words in in a sentence. But I think it's that complexity of understanding. And I think in your answer, you you talk about that ebb and flow of space. Is that a park at lunchtime is different to a park during the, the during the daytime when people are at work? And it both still fulfills a function of. I might want to be there by myself walking through it, but then also I want to place to gather. So I've, I guess this idea of how these spaces can hold all these intentions at once, I think is really, really powerful. I think Duncan, Duncan, sir, please. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think sort of leading on from, from what Canon was saying, um, I think I'd, I'd like to um, promote a, an attitude of forgiveness uh, which is sort of what Rosanna and, and you were talking about, AJ, <clears throat> where it's, you know, it's okay to, to give things a try and, and see how it pans out, which is the opposite of planning, really. And um, the, the, it, came, it came from the quote from Incredible Edible, uh, where they, they, they say it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And the, the work that they do, um, if, if you're not aware of Incredible Edible, you should um, look them up. They're an organisation in Todmorden, um, just outside of Manchester. And they, a few years ago, took over their town and um, decided that they were going to implement uh, community gardens across the, the town. And they've planted up areas of leftover space and they planted the front of the police station because they thought it looked a bit drab. And they did all of this without um, prior permission or, or anything like that. But just by uh, random acts of kindness, they felt that they'd be able to get away with it. And they have done and they've really uh, turned around the, the whole attitude of the town. And um, that would be something that would be great to bring in across country and the world but because all the best spaces are, are the the impromptu and, and sort of unplanned places really where the spontaneous uh, events can can occur amazing 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 thank you so much for that um duncan again um acts of everyday kindness as well so is there's so many concepts that we can try to envision and embody as well and i guess this is this is this will, would make this space so so rich and again right now it is a great time to to think about all of these things um so thank you guys i think those those are the round of questions um we've um the audience and the guests have been adding questions into the q a so we're going to jump into that um right now so i'm going to pick one of the first ones and it's from abigail king um i live in a working class um background in northern english town and often it feels that people are concentrating too hard on basic survival to think about abstract concepts of place. How do you bring everyone along? Question. Anyone, anyone. Uncle, you've got a great smile right now. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question again okay, so they don't time. miss any of it? Um, I live in a working class Northern English town and often it feels that people are concentrating too hard on basic survival to think about abstract concepts of place. How do you bring everyone along? And that was by Abigail King. Well, I suppose the easy example is just as we said, incredible edible mm. uh, in, in Todmorden. Um, yeah, it was a, a very uh, deprived and, and uh, run down uh, town and, and the, the, the local residents all clubbed together and um decided to do it themselves and and, and that's what they did and um it, it is possible um with uh, can, you know group group efforts to to turn these places around and now it's a internationally recognized um organization that and they get invited all around the world to to help uh, improve uh, the urban environments of various towns and cities Amazing, amazing. Great example, great example. Um, I think Rosanna has raised yeah. her hand. Yes, yeah, sure. And then, I'll, and then I'll pass to Marcus. Just to build on Duncan's point about um, Todmorden, because they do get vegetable tourism. Like pe people have come, that's what they describe it. People have come from, you know, China to, to check out how they're growing vegetables. And I think a lot of the work that Marcus and I've done is about this idea of signs and symbols, almost as Jessica, you were pointing out the common language. 
to, to be honest, the common language, I think, sometimes can be as simple as someone yeah. planting carrots in front of the police station, which is kind of what happened in Todmorden. Just the notion that, like, mm, maybe it's OK. Why not instead of why, you know? Um, so it, it, sound, <laughs> it sounds odd, but we, when we talk about signs of confidence, and I know that you guys work with that a, a, a lot also, AJ, it's, a, it's, it's sort of giving someone who it's given us when we when we like life is on top of you literally on a personal level mm. what what can give you the confidence to do something a little bit differently to take you out of the everyday and that's why we people like spontaneity because it's like day-to-day -day can get dull and mundane especially if it's by rote and we've got a lot of problems to deal with one little thing can turn it so i i think don't underestimate that and don't underestimate i think the the people who started incredible edibles had a lot of oomph and a lot of vision and sometimes you do need some community champions to keep it going um, mm. for sure really no good points but then i think one of the things we've noticed as well is like the invite and the recurring invite and making it as simple as possible as well to breaking it down so that it can just be come and come to this potluck and whatever you bring is valuable and then you're part of this collective spectacle which then becomes this thing which also um very very powerful i think cara has got something to add to this point um, from a question from abigail yeah i i really like that question's a really important one and i think um i can't look in my notes now i can't find who wrote it down but the different access points into this is really important and whilst community gardening will work for some it will be a complete turn off to others for various different reasons. Um, and so finding a whole you know, portfolio of different textures and tenures to get people involved is the real, you know, in my experience, has been a solution to this. Um, and also just to never assume that it's not just people doing something that's going to be interesting. You have to ask for having a seat at their community table. Um, and if anybody has heard me speak uh, before, they, they will have heard this, but um, Jana Van Hoosick and her her uh, sort of mantra that the community is the expert in being the community, um, it's, they do have the answers to what they want their place to look like and how, it's, how they want it to function. Um, and it's just finding a way to get that conversation started. And it is going to be different for each place. It's going to be different for each type of in-place community as well. And I thought I was just, and there's, there's also quite um, comments in here around the way that York have approached this, which I thought was really interesting with local councillors embedded as well. That's one way to generate, you know, people res respond to that kind of um, uh, conversation intervention. Um, and then there's a project that was mentioned in the chat as well from um, University of Sheffield, an approach that they were taking as well to engage different demographics in place. So I think there you can see there's a really good mix um, and variety and, you know, participatory city is another example of different ways to have those, those conversations. Um, but yeah, fantastic question. Thank you. Yes, thank you so, so, so much. And again, very, thank you to everyone in the chat, keeping the chat alive with some great, great insight. Hopefully we can extrapolate some of those, right, like, and make like a little note afterwards. But I think, Marcus, you raised your hand as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's a brilliant question, the topic around, you know, the busyness of the everyday and the, I guess, the, the kind of the opportunity or the economic privilege of, of some people in a position, you know, I can't just go out there and fund uh, 200 or 500 of my neighbours to start planting and I can't just initiate that activity. I've got the everyday to get on with. I've got X, Y, Z to do. Um, we've got to make, we've all got to pay our rent and so on. And, and uh, thankfully, I think my first response to that is thankfully all the places, if we think, if each of us think of the places that are really kind of shine in character or soul, actually it's nothing to do with the economics of those places. It's, there's so much variation in, in some places are, you know, economically massively deprived and can be fantastically rich in their, in their character and their soul and, and the, the, how the community thrives in those places. It, uh, you know, yes, it'd be, the economics would be a fantastic support. I'm not saying it, it won't, but uh, I think that I I don't have a, I don't get a sense that the economics is the is the kind of the inhibitor to how to how much a place can thrive. Thankfully, at the same time, I would say 
there's been lots of speak over the last decade or 15 years of, of meanwhile places and today we've been talking about experimentation and spontaneity i think the step that i'm hearing might be that around how can we move beyond meanwhile we're not talking about meanwhile anymore we're talking about building this into the everyday how can we yes cara mentioned allowing people to continue those conversations and i took that to mean verbally but actually how can how can people continue those conversations in practice in the everyday when you go down to the shops how does it how can it feel like it reflects you a bit more how can it when in the everyday when you go and pick your kids up or when you go and get your paper or go to the doctors how can it feel like it reflects you and the people you live near a bit more how these to me are the, like some of the big challenges now i think it we sort of need to move beyond this idea of meanwhile as a thing that's just like here's a little bit of space for a little bit of time uh where everyone can play and then we'll close it all off and do something that's more economically sustainable actually for places to to live and for people to be counted this is these topics are vital thank you so much for that marcus again i think that refers back to canon's earlier part of like precise like the precision and the intention behind these things and the longevity that we need to plan for in terms of long-term thinking and i think duncan talk, talked about stewardship as well all these things interlink into like making that kind of vision possible um we got a great question from may um okay i'm gonna read it out we're talking about community but there's so much movement working from home means people moving abroad uh precarity means people moving for jobs etc so many people in their 20s and 30s don't have a sense of belonging to a community because they're not staying in one place for long enough. How can one foster communities when the turnaround of inhabitants is so frequent? Very, very strong question. Um, <laughs> to save ourselves to that for the, for the people. <laughs> I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Yeah. I think, I think you know, there's two things to me that are interesting about this. Is one that like um, we do take. Remember, we take a sense of place with us too. You know, that that is basically what what migrant communities, diasporas do. We and I think that well, one of the things we try and look at is that that aspect of place doesn't just have to be physical. It could come in what we're cooking and the recipe we can create. You, you know, it could come in to Jessica's point some of the patterns that we deem to be ours. So sometimes there are, um, as we could come in music, especially as a great way to kind of bring it together. And I think sometimes we, if, you know, it, again, someone references, so looking back to the global South, I think like the point is like looking to other parts in the world of the world where this has, is just part of everyday life. And, and you know, we uh, reference Brazil a lot as an example in terms of its ability, like Brazilian culture's ability to, to find ways around the system and you know to find ways to to there's a term for it jeitinho means the way around literally so i think sometimes um to that point like what what of the place can we take with us that's part of us number one number two if you flip it there are some really interesting examples okay they're quite quick but uh or, or they're related more to some an earlier question about migration um but we looked at this for there's a project in germany well, actually across europe called kitchen on the run which worked with that was working with refugee populations who were who were moving across Europe into Germany um, and finding ways, uh, like basically kitchens for for that to be a space to come together with people to cook to celebrate. So I think this idea of sometimes celebration, which are like you know intense moments where people can come together, not necessarily on the everyday, but you build trust, can be a way to kickstart something too. Um, to 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 just throw throw out ideas there, but. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I think, oh, some, somebody, did I hear something? No. Um, I think Alessandro has a, a point to build on it and a potential provocation. So if the turnaround of inhabitants is a feature of a place, how could we then embrace it as well? So this further builds on it. Could we, could we, could that then become the feature of a space that embraces this kind of turnaround in a way? I believe so. I definitely, yeah, go on. But I, yeah, I, I would totally agree. And I think this is one of, you know, it's one of the most exciting things that I think uh, for, for people living in cities with really multicultural populations or really kind of it, like people living in big cities where life changes all the time. 
like how do we you know how do we make sure they're to so within that point it's like okay the time becomes our important factor if you're only here for a year how can we make it as easy for you how can we invite you you know to get involved as quickly as possible so that barrier isn't language or that barrier isn't the fact that i don't like you know community gardening but there's something else in my culture that is important um so invitation number one super important time how do we do it quickly there's, there's a really interesting project that happened in Sydney with the uh, University of Sydney, uh, sorry, UTS, some uh, number of years back when they were trying to address challenges of street urination. And they took they took a frame to approach it of a festival. But actually, if you take a frame like a festival, what would it look like if you were to treat an everyday neighbourhood if it's a if it's a fluctuating neighborhood or a place where lots of students live or a place where we know that jobs and rents are, are so uh, demands or make dem determine so much variation of the population maybe it's better to s establish a neighborhood for to work resiliently and perhaps in a way that a festival works for its community to come in and come out and change over and so it can can the neighbourhood be set up to accommodate and thrive on this kind of changing, thrive with this changing population rather than having to sort of close its doors and say, oh, OK, I'm just uh, I'm just going to be this wall and this door and uh, I don't want you to touch me because you're only here for four months. Thank you very much. So I'm really interested by those topics and those ideas of, of event or as an approach, not just as a as a way to program, but as an approach to design and to involve people in shorter periods of time. Okay. And I think that kind of speaks to Jessica's points again in terms of like looking at materials and uh, and like the form that we can then hold these things in and like designing for time, designing how can we then use the materials and things to elicit these 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 kind of um, signs and signals um, to a space. Um, Beautiful, beautiful. I think we've got maybe one more question before we go to Cara um, to close us off with any final points. Um, do do do. And this is from Piaver. Okay, I'm Piaverio. Sorry, apologies if I butchered the, butchered the name. But the question is how do how to best integrate peacemaking projects to the city planning pro processes? How to change the culture of city planning? We often hit the wall their su um, support and collaboration with city planners, but the long-term impact, for instance, placemaking processes integrated into city planning is not easy to achieve. How's it? Anyone? Did that speak to anyone? <laughs> it's any, a good question. It's Go a on. good question. Any of the architects or urban designers? Otherwise, um, <laughs> you guys have to come up against that system quite a bit, but, or within that system, I should say. I'm sorry, AJ, would you mind reading it again? <laughs> I got <laughs> lost the thread of it halfway through. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, we do only have, but may, maybe potentially we can come back to that question um, just in case, because we're going to um, close off with Cara. And if people have time to stick around, we can dig into that. So, yeah, I'll hand over to Cara to, to close us off for the official. <laughs> Thank you. I am ducking out of the party early, as you might have seen in the in the chat there. I have to go and be an examiner for a uni uh, for the rest of the afternoon. Um, incredible conversation, incredible chat. Um, there are some fantastic practitioners in the room here today, and it's been such a great knowledge exchange going on in the chat too. Um, there will be a planning and policy event coming up um, so that might answer or go some way to answer that last question uh, but I look forward to seeing what you say when I check back into the event later. The film of this event will go up on the YouTube channel. A lot of you have asked for references for different people that have been mentioned through this and so um, I will gather those and we can share those online um, as well. Um, and just again a last thank you from me to everybody here and to the panel and for forming a fantastic chapter in the placemaking handbook and a fantastic talk today so thank you everybody very very much thanks cara sorry to leave early but enjoy <laughs>
worries no worries i will ask rosanna so i don't know so do we have it like 10 more minutes or so maybe to dig into some of these things yeah absolutely absolutely we do if anybody does have to leave we're just putting some in the chat some contact details if you want to keep the conversation going but you have to uh leave right now so do do get in touch there um yeah i think should we pick up the conversation around around planning uh because that's a good one it's we've talked a lot about community driven like ground up initiatives and I think this was really about how does it scale up and it was a question coming from Finland actually from uh, uh, Pipe in Finland. Okay beautiful I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it again. Sure. <laughs> how to best integrate peace uh, or place making projects to the city planning processes, how to change the culture of city planning. We often hit the wall there, support and collaboration with city planners but the long-term impact for instance place making processes integrated into city planning is not easy to achieve. Mm. Do you, well, I, I, I'm, I'll kick it off with just as an, as an example. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if it's sitting in the right team, if it's sitting in the right department. So to, just to give you an example, I found out uh, recently that in Stockholm, the, um, they have a placemaking uh, team that sat within their tourism uh, team, which is kind of interesting. So it's basically taking a different perspective on the city. Like the tour, obviously, we've had some conversation here about tourists' stories and you know the local stories. That's fine, but I wonder if it came out of the planning uh, if, of, of the planning and, and sat maybe as its own department. Would that make a difference? Uh, because very often with placemaking, you're drawing on health. You know, you're drawing on culture. You're drawing on education as well as the physical aspects. Um, that's a provocation to the to the rest of the panelists in the crowd. I think from from um, from the, our take on placemaking as as architects and designers, it, I'm pleased to to say that I, I don't think we tend to run into any sort of stumbling blocks in terms of planning, which is refreshing sort of thing to say. It, it's not something that's usually sort of obstructed by planning in 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 my experience um, and a lot of the responsibility sort of falls with the the developer and the, the manager of the uh, the space or the, or the place and it's it's that uh, ability to um, to allow the the place to grow and thrive and ha not have to overly manage the 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 place to to, um, to to allow people freedom and, and the welcome into the, the, the place that's, that's the main obstacle I think from from my perspective. Thank you for that. Marcus I think has something to say. Yeah thanks just uh, of Duncan's comment really I, I think Duncan earlier you mentioned stewardship groups and a really this really interesting idea of kind of how did you describe it executing a project but not finishing a project and I I think that's a, a really profound idea that may, although you say you haven't, you don't come into difficulty with planning, it, it kind of, that, is, that isn't really the model for construction or built environment projects at the moment. The, the model is of planning is, okay, this is the start, this is the finish, this is the approvals process, and this is the finish. Not that something should keep changing. So how, I'm interested for kind of, do, Duncan, do you, in your notion of stewardship groups, do you manage to build that into to the model of what, what's proposed going forward? Or how do you support that or ensure that it, it keeps happening and keeps working? Uh, well, it's like I say, it's, it's about the, the management of the, the place and, and the, the, the owner of, of that place, how they allow this stewardship to happen and encourage it to happen. Um, and in in the instance of, um, for example, uh, the Derwentthorpe in in York, which is um, owned and developed by the Round Trees Trust, they, for example, have a, a community fund that the residents in the in development can apply for some money, uh, small sums of money that they can then. Uh, implement different ideas and and interventions within the, the landscape, and to, to for it to change over time, um, and and so 
not only are they giving the funds, but they're also giving the permission mm. and the encouragement to say, That's you know, you can adapt things and change as you want over time. That's really interesting. It'd be, it'd be amazing to see how that can play out in different contexts. Mm. I think it's a great model for starting off. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Thanks for that answer. Um, there's another question here, and it's from Tom Collins. Um, and maybe should we do maybe one or two more questions? Yeah. yeah, so two more questions. So Tom asks, a central, um, a central square is always an interesting case in question. The most lively and interesting to those with state skateboarders and buskers and graffiti. They're great to drift in and walk through and sit at and watching everyone, everything go on. But such places may not be accessible or appealing to lots of groups who then lose out on the square. The council then chases away the skateboarders are they breaking down the magic of a space or making sure it's accessible to the most to the most amount of people? Oh, that <laughs> friction of planning. It's a good question. Friction and multiplicity and who what caters to who when. Um, Rosanna laughed. Rosanna, did you I'm hear? laughing because I think Marcus is laughing. Marcus has done a lot of work around this actually, but um, it just so just as a bit of context, this reminds me of um, a square in in Barcelona. Um, so we both uh, kind of got our play, place making public space, let's say, training uh, in Barcelona, and there's a big square in front of the art museum there, um, uh, which is full of skaters. In fact, it, it's this term is it's kind of called out as a mecca for skaters. I think really from across across Europe. Um, the council started to bring in really heavy fines, like 400 euro fines, which for a you know 15 year old skater kid is well for anyone is a lot, but for very for, for typical skaters is an incredible amount of money. Um, and and this started to kick off a kind of attention because it really was a, a spot for people to go and watch exactly the athletics of of you know um, of these kids. So I'm going to hand that to Marcus, but I just wanted to raise it um, mm -hmm. as a a good example of that tension. Uh, I don't really want to or feel capable of answering all of this question, but um, it's really, yeah, really pertinent question. Um, I guess some of the dry responses are, there are things like skate plazas that different cities have been working on for some years. If you take opportunities like, or activities like skateboarding, where slowly, slowly, they haven't been developing as quickly or successfully as some people hope to think, but sometimes, you know, there are opportunities to bring different activities together through kind of formalized constructions such as skate plazas, which in other words is a, is a skatable public space that's kind of has trees in it and seats in it as well as skate, having some skateboardable elements. There's a really beautiful example in Paris it's not a plaza so much as a street i'm afraid the name of the street has escaped me but um it seems it, it's stunning um and and so on one hand there's that there's that the other hand is i'd go back to what jessica was talking about of, of making materials work for the communities so there aren't always reasons why materials can't be resilient enough to accommodate skateboarding or to accommodate graffiti writing or, or street art or to accommodate multiple activities at different times of day or at different periods of a year. Um, you don't find, you very rarely find that the same communities want to use the same spaces in, in each of their ways all at the same time. Occasionally that happens, but actually some kind of natural selection can happen too in, in some cases. And I, I think um, it's really interesting to think about how materials and and policy can support a kind of a, a slightly unframed coming together of different groups. Sometimes the most successful spaces don't have um, definition for particular activities. They just have shapes or they just have forms or colors. Mm -hmm. And those shapes and forms and colors are read by different users or different in interest groups or different publics, if you like. And so if I'm, if I'm interested in rock climbing, I might climb up one side of a wall if I'm, and you know, but it just so happens that there's a, there's a soft bit of kids uh, play surfacing on the floor, or if I'm interested in, in a different, and it's not that it's not to say this is the space for this activity, but, but to provide to, I think we can work harder to look at how we can make spaces work for a wider wider ranges of communities and interest groups 
without them feeling like they're in conflict or it's only one or only the other. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Um, any more? I, I think that kind of rounds it off potentially. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, thank you so much for Rosanna and Dong um, and Matt, Marcus, sorry, um, for holding the space and kicking off this conversation. Um, if you want to, oh, okay, so things are coming in. I'm getting distracted. No, but yes, really, really beautiful conversation. And I say again, it's, it's so good to have this horizontal conversation and getting so many different voices into this space. So really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'll hand it over to Rosanna and sure. yeah. Okay, um, I, likewise, thank you. Thanks for staying engaged and kind of past the time. Um, I just want to highlight, if you do want to stay uh, involved, kind of keep the conversation going, because I think we're all inspired by the amount of knowledge sharing and ideas that are out there, um, then please do. I'm going to quickly see if I can uh, share my screen and get up some details for you to do so. Um, we have a number of different ways to get involved. Let's see if this will work for us. Yeah, here we go. Um, here we are. Um, so you can find more at urbanlutzikens.org. And if you did have, um, you know, we were hoping to, to publish some of the responses to some of these questions on the website uh, for everybody. If you've got questions on email or anything, any opportunities or ideas that you want to get in touch about, send us an email. Um, we're going to start up a, a, a Slack channel because these ideas are popping out all the time, especially now after COVID. Um, and we will be starting uh, to work uh, on Instagram. Uh, we're kicking off a project with Central St. Martins to build, in fact, a kind of uh, a, a lexicon, let's say, a kind of common language to uh, Jessica's point uh, in April. So watch this space because there'll be uh, there'll be some uh, some uh, some work that's going to start coming out of this. And we'd love to share that uh, as well. So massive thank you to everybody, uh, especially our panelists and to AJ and to Lisa in the mm. background mm. <laughs> for, for getting involved. Uh, and I hope this is just the start. That's really the idea. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Wow. Well,